My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics <laughs> because I want to give it a lighter edge. And also, they work for less. See you there. Looking ahead to this afternoon, and the UK is looking dry for most parts of the UK. But there will be some showers, especially in the south. Let's take a look at the details. After a bright morning across the southwest, it will be a cloudy afternoon with some outbreaks of rain moving north. It will be windy here too, especially near the coast. Apart from a few showers, the southeast and east Anglia will have a bright afternoon. It will be feeling fresher though than of late. Northern Wales will also have a rather sunny afternoon, but across the south it will be cloudy, with the odd spot of rain possible. The Midlands could also see the odd shower this afternoon, but northwest England will be dry with plenty of sunshine. Temperatures in Manchester could reach 19 degrees Celsius. Northeast England will see a dry afternoon, but there will be some cloud at times. In any sunshine, though, temperatures will reach the high teens. Blustery showers will continue to affect northern Scotland through the afternoon. Further south, it will be dry but cloudy. It'll feel fresh in the north, but fairly pleasant further south. Northern Ireland will see sunny skies this afternoon. The brisk northerly breeze will keep it feeling fresh, especially near the north coast. Outbreaks of rain may affect many southern counties this evening, otherwise most will remain dry but feeling fresh. And that's how the weather is shaping up for the rest of the day. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. This is Real Britain with me, Emily Carver, on TV, DAB and online. Today we'll be discussing the rail strikes, which inevitably kick off tomorrow, and why I think they are so potentially damaging. We've also got the housing crisis, the government's rental reforms bill, and Father's Day, of course. Happy Father's Day to all uh, those fathers who are watching or listening at home. But first, it's the news with Bethany Elsie.
Thanks, Emily. Good afternoon. It's one minute past two. I am Bethany Elsie in the GB Newsroom. The Transport Secretary is accusing rail unions of punishing millions of innocent people over the planned national strikes next week. Thousands of rail workers will go on strike on Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. Grant Shapp says the RMT union has ignored requests to negotiate a resolution. The union claims its members have now taken a 20% pay cut amid rising inflation. Labour claim the government want the strikes to go ahead to stoke political divisions. And RMT's former Assistant General Secretary Steve Headley told GB News he agrees with Labour. They want the distraction from soaring fuel prices, from the cost of living crisis, and uh, they want to take on the unions. It's a great distraction. It's red meat for the Tory voters. Uh, they rally the party faithful. So I think we do, and I think this uh, strike's really avoidable. I think we should be uh, still around the negotiating table, but rather than negotiate in good faith with the unions, SAP seems more interested in uh, the latest soundbite in the press. The Labour leader says Tories are hoarding power in the capital, which is directly linked to the cost of living crisis. Speaking in Coventry, Sakia Starmer warned the government's levelling up plans will fail if they don't devolve power outside of Whitehall. The levelling up secretary, Michael Gove, has previously said it's essential to address the UK's regional inequalities. Sakia said a Labour government would end one-year funding settlements to ensure councils have more stable income. Hoarding power has consequences. The Tory economic record is terrible. Low growth for 12 years. Stagnant wages. And the reason for this is we're not making the most of every part of our country. We're squandering the potential in our towns, in our cities, in our coastal areas and our rural communities. All the places that you represent, we're squandering the potential. The new head of the British Army has warned his troops must prepare to fight in Europe as the war continues in Ukraine. General Sir Patrick Sanders said it's imperative to build an army that is capable of fighting against Russia. After returning from his trip to Ukraine's capital yesterday, the Prime Minister said we need to steel ourselves for a long war. General Sir Richard Barons told GB News earlier the British Army is facing the most profound transformation of defence and security for more than 100 years. The digital age is changing um, the way you fight wars and it's not just drones and missiles and precision, it's about robotics and autonomy and, and, and biosciences. So the Chief of General Staff has to change his army to deal with a much higher level of threat and he has to transform it for the digital age. And he needs to tell his people that and he needs government to help him do it. In France, voting is underway in the second and final round of the French parliamentary elections. President Emmanuel Macron, who was re-elected in April against Marine Le Pen, needs 289 sorry, seats for a majority in Parliament. But pollsters say his centrist group may fall short as smaller parties make gains. Macron's party won the first round of elections last Sunday, whilst the left-wing alliance came in second. Car insurance fell to its lowest level in more than six years in the first quarter of this year. The Association of British Insurers found the average price was £416, the lowest number since 2015. That's despite pressures from the rising costs and supply chain problems exacerbated by the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. A loan that provides emergency funds to the most financially vulnerable will be offered to 20,000 people. The no-interest loan scheme is backed by the government but run by credit unions and other lenders. It'll help people who would have otherwise been denied a loan to buy things like laptops, school uniforms and household essentials. The scheme is being trialled in Manchester and will be rolled out to other parts of the UK from September. And Olympic champion Dame Kelly Holmes has shared her relief at publicly coming out as gay. The 52-year-old told the Sunday Mirror she's kept it a secret for decades, living in fear of her repercussions of being in the army, but said she's known since she was 17. The two-time Olympic gold medalist said hiding it has caused mental health issues and although nervous, she's now excited. The news is out. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens now, though. Let's get back to Real Britain with Emily. Hello, I'm back. Emily Carver here for Real Britain. 
Um, I'm just trying to work my auto cue at the moment, if you can please get it back. Here's what's coming up in this hour. Thank you. So, are we facing a summer of discontent, a warmer version uh, than the 1970s? The largest rail strike in 30 years begins tomorrow, and union bosses said this morning that action will spread to other sectors. Of course it will. And it's Father's Day, but why are some dads unable to see their kids today? And does the legal system treat dads fairly? I'll speak to a campaigner who thinks not. And why are some kids, according to a new report, starting school unable to say their own names, unable to drink from a cup, still needing to be potty trained and the like? Bad? Is this bad repainting or the lasting damage of a childhood in lockdown? That's what we're talking about for the next hour. I'd love to know your thoughts on the strikes. Will you be affected? And do you support the rail workers? Tweet me at Carver Emily or at GB News, or you can email me on GBviews at GBNews.uk. You can watch us online too on YouTube. And don't forget Facebook. You'll find lots of brilliant content on the GB News page. Thank you very much. The government can't let a minority of public sector workers, activists, union bosses and failed politicians hold the rest of us to ransom. Yesterday, thousands marched through London in support of the rail strikes, calling for public sector pay rises and, predictably, demanding Tories out. There in the crowd were the usual suspects. First, the ringleaders, the RMT, whose chief earns a whopping £124,000 a year. Nice work if you can get it. We had the socialist workers out in force, of course. What would a protest be without them? The teachers' unions, the BMA, all joined in the fun. And what would a protest be without magic grandpa Jezza Corbyn and Angela Rayner prancing about, grinning alongside activists, posing in front of every defy Tory rule placard they can find? And for what was meant to be a cost-of-living protest, at least that's how it was advertised, there were rather a lot of other causes being protested, weren't there? Trans rights now, end racism at work now, refugees welcome, the list goes on. They were all spotted there, weren't they? Of course, of course, protest is a part of democracy, but a little bit of self-awareness wouldn't go amiss. Those threatening strike action are ever so slightly disingenuous, in my view. They know as well as anyone else that demand for ra rail travel simply has not returned to where it was pre-pandemic. Commuter habits have changed, and revenue remains around 80% of the 2019 figure. At the same time, costs have skyrocketed. They demand all existing jobs be maintained, that all its members should receive an inflation-busting pay hike. But let's get real. The state of the railway's finances simply can't withstand that. And let's remember, 40% of people in this country, taxpayers, never even use the railways. Why should they have to fork out for bumper pay rises for workers demanding special treatment? It seems to me that given taxpayers spent unsustainable amounts of money keeping essentially empty trains moving during lockdown, savings need to be made somewhere. The government's target of one to two billion pounds of cost savings seems pretty reasonable to me. Something's got to give. The right to strike exists to protect working people from abusive employers and exploitation, not as a method to racketeer pay rises out of the general public's pockets. What we're seeing here is one group of workers who think they have the right to stamp their feet, scream and shout, pretend they're more hard done by than anyone else, and demand more money at the expense of the rest of us. What's more, it's not even as if the unions represent the majority of the workforce. Last year, union membership fell to just 23.1% of employees. It's the lowest level since membership was recorded in this way. And what bugs me too is many of the most militant protests are likely to be the very same people that who rallied against the government when they sought to reopen the economy during the lockdown, during the pandemic. They're the same ones who wanted to keep us locked down longer and harder. Judging by the placards on display, they also want open borders, more money for the NHS, across the board public sector pay rises, more foreign aid, the list goes on. Where on earth do they think this money comes from? And the irony is that there will be less money to go around, not more after these protests than before. It's estimated that the national rail strikes on Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday alone will cost this nation £150 million. They demand all existing jobs be maintained, that all its members should receive an inflation-busting pay hike. But let's get, get real. The state of the railway's finances simply can't withstand that. The right to strike 
sorry, let me just go down here. I'm just this, this uh, uh, cue card here is just simply not working for me very well today. Um, let's go back to here. So do those supporting the RMT actually care about the jobs? of people in the hospitality industry, those people who work hard, who are poorly paid as well, they're going to take a tremendous hit, up to a billion pounds the industry has warned. Does the RMT care about their jobs? It doesn't seem to me that they do. People like Angela Rayner will happily stand in front of placards demanding across the board public sector pay hikes, but they'll never advocate any cuts to public spending or accept any trade-offs. The economic illiteracy is plain to see. The government should stand up to the unions and refuse their demands. Sometimes we have to accept trade-offs. I'll say it again. The government can't let the unions hold ordinary people and workers to ransom. So, Britain is facing a summer of discontent, with more workers set to be balloted on strike action. The head of the National Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers, or the RMT, has said today, claiming industrial action could spread to other sectors. Indeed, some of those who lived through the 70s say there is a whiff of the winter of discontent in the air. So, are the unions justified in their actions, or are they holding struggling working people to ransom in the middle of a cost of living crisis. Joining me now is former Labour MP Stephen Pound. Hi Stephen, how are you this morning, this afternoon even? Grand, uh, no autocue troubles here whatsoever. I know, I'm having a bit of a nightmare here. I'm hoping I can just smile and everyone will forgive me. Um, well, so... you're, you're doing the old the swan on the surface. You know, I can see your feet paddling like mad underneath it. No, you're doing I know. Well. Luckily, uh, people can only, only see me from the uh, waist upwards. So, do you think the powers of the unions need to be curtailed? You know, I'm sitting here and I'm wondering how on earth millions of people are going to get to work, how much money this is going to cost the economy. They say they need more money to spend on wages, etc., etc., but this is going to make it even harder for the government to be dishing out money. Well, let's, 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 get a, let's get real in, in your own expression. Let's actually talk about a few facts. Um, you know, I was very much involved in, in the health worker strikes in 1979. And one of the results was that was we, some of us got pay rises, but inflation went up. So the pay rises became worthless because mortgage rates went up, the cost of food went up, the cost of living power went up. And it gave us 18 years of a Conservative government. My problem with this present range of strikes, particularly the RMT, and I think it's important to get on record, the RMT is not affiliated to the Labour Party. The RMT supports people who stand against the Labour Party. The RMT is not part of what I would call the mainstream Labour movement. You know, they are interested more in the destruction of global capitalism than actually improving the economic lot of the workers and the people of this country. Now, look, if you really cared about this country and about the workforce, there are ways of doing this. I think that what the RMT and the rail unions, in fact, all trade unions should do, and many of them do do, is to actually work sensibly and constructively with the government and just say, look, we're not going to start from a position of absolute bitter animosity. Above all, we're not going to be so inept and to take the playbook from the, the Ladybird Book of Industrial Relations and throw everything, all your cards on the table for the first deal. You can't say that we're going to have an all-out strike. If you're going to do sensible industrial relations, you've got to allow the, uh, your, the opposition, the other side of the table, some room to retreat. You can't actually say right here and now we want bang, 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 the whole lot. You can't do that. Now, look, there's going to be huge industrial technological change within the transport services. We know that. There's probably not going to be ticket offices. A tiny number of people buy their tickets at the present time from a ticket office. It'll probably go online. But there are people who are going to be excluded from that you know, because they don't have access to it. We should be thinking about how we can actually reach those people. Why on earth can't the unions, the RMT and the other unions, sit down with government and say, look, we're not interested in sectional battling here. We're not interested in you know, bringing around global socialism by Tuesday lunchtime. We're actually interested in the economic future and prosperity of this country because the unions said, and union members are a crucial Stephen, part you said, of the economy Sorry, Stephen, to interrupt you. Sorry to interrupt you, but you said, you know, this is nothing to do with the Labour Party, the RMT strikes, the boss, uh, what is it, Matt Lynch, I think his name is. He's got nothing to do with the Labour Party. But Angela Rayner was out there, you know, campaigning for global socialism. She was backing the strikes, bring the Tory party down, all the different, you know, gimmicky slogans. She was out there. You had lots of other Labour MPs out there too. Surely for people sitting at home, they see this very much as being connected to the Labour Party. 
No, it's Angela Rayner, and I, I think quite right, is there in, in sympathy. She's there supporting the principle that actually the workforce should be engaged and they should be in, 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 in a position to actually better the general life of their, of their workers and of their members. That's not an endorsement of what the RMT is doing. That's an endorsement of what the TUC is doing. The TUC represents unions that are affiliated to the Labour Party and unions that are affiliated against the Labour Party. They're not interested in us. So I, I have every, every confidence and support and sympathy for Angela on that. What I don't do is have confidence and support and sympathy for those people who think that they can actually change the world order. They can ab abolish capitalism tomorrow. They can somehow have the, you know, the, the great waving fields of corn and you know, ballet every night that you know, people used to say was the, the, the day, daily routine in the song. Soviet Union. I'm sorry, it's just in imbecilic and, and it's naive and it's stupid. And wouldn't it be better for the Labour Party to be seen to be on the side of the commuters rather than on the side of those people who You'd actually like to want to bring so, down I think, the state? I think this is, they also got it so terribly wrong when so many um, MPs in the Labour Party were very happy to be seen in support of Extinction Rebellion. Right at the time, Extinction Rebellion protesters were stopping or attempting to stop people from making their commutes, ordinary working people trying to travel across London on the tubes, for example. But do you know what worries me the most? Well, one of the things that worries me about mm. the most is that this doesn't look like it's going to stop at rail. As the RMT chief, whether we believe him or not, but I think he's right in his predictions that this could spread to more public services across the public sector. You know, we might see the doctors striking, we might see the teachers striking, we might see all sorts of groups striking. And I do think, you know, there are lots of people working in this country in the private sector who also haven't seen their pay increase and they can't strike. They'd just be given the sack. And so, you know, it just seems to me that they haven't got their, their heads screwed on and they talk about the government not being in touch, but I don't think they look very in touch. No, no, I, I think you make a very, very powerful point. I mean, my son is a self-employed electrician. Um, you know, I'd, I'd want him to join a trade union because of the insurance, and I think I believe in the solidarity of joining a trade union. But he doesn't get any benefit from this. Look, the, the reality is that, and I think you're absolutely right to high point, high point this, that the fact it could well extend beyond the, you know, the transport sector. But if it does, if we do get into a situation where inflation absolutely roars out of control, then you know, the value of the money that you actually earn and win and gain is going to be diminished and, and dissolved. It's, it's point. It's, it's playground politics and it's playground economics. And it's so damn stupid. And I think the problem is, and I mean, you know, when you actually talk to Eddie Dempsey and Nick Lynch and people like that, they seem perfectly reasonable people. But their agenda is not about bettering working people's lives across the country. It's not about the economic health of the nation. It's about their own vision of some socialist nirvana, which, you know, in an ideal world, it may, may, be, may be there, may be good, good, clean fun. But in reality, it ain't going to happen. I mean, I'm here at the Royal British Legion in Greenford um, with the Royal Naval Association just about to enjoy a tot. And I've just done a little quick poll, poll, poll round here asking people what they think. The animosity down here towards the trade union movement and the animosity even towards some of the pro-union legislation that the Labour Party brought in, like, you know, stopping people uh, have using agency staff during strikes, is actually becoming visceral. I think the problem is that some of the unions are going to actually sow the, sow the wind and reap the whirlwind on this one. And what do we do about this? Because this is something that I've been thinking about quite a lot. It seems in this country we've got many divisions politically, but one of the biggest divisions, and this is something I've seen particularly young people as well, but also older people, is that division between public sector and private sector workers. It seems that there is a very strong divide in attitudes towards economic policy, for example, that's really dividing us as a nation. Do you see that too? Very much so, and, and it's a great tragedy. Um, in, in the public sector, you tend to get um, public service leave, which is time to actually, you know, if you're a councillor um, or, if, or if you're a shop student, don't forget, most councils will actually give trade union officers and shop stewards within the public sector unions time off during the course of the year, you know, paid time off to actually pursue their union work. And fair play if that's what you've negotiated. But on the other hand, there has to be another side of the coin. You have to accept that if you're in an absolutely secure job, with a pretty decent pension, then you have to actually respect the, the, your, the fortune, fortunate position you're in. And what particularly disturbs me about the present RMT menu of demands is that most of them, most of them are irrelevant. I mean, there is no threat to the pensions. The voluntary redundancy scheme is massively oversubscribed already. So I just really don't understand. But above all, as someone who is a democratic socialist, who's been a trade unionist since, you know, since the day I started work, I don't like to see 
trade unions brought into disrepute and people able to throw around words like, you know, holding the country to ransom. And I understand and respect your very, very strong views on this, Emily, although, to be honest, I don't actually subscribe to most of them. However, I think that in this particular case, the trade unions are making Boris Johnson's life a lot happier and they're showing him that there's perhaps a key in the cell door and he could escape and God help this country if we have another 18 years of the Tories. Thank you, Good Steve. Health. Stephen, that was thoroughly reasonable. Cheers to you. Cheers to you on Father's Day. Uh, that was Labour MP Stephen Pound. He was great. Very reasonable for a former Labour MP, I think. Um, so plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. Next, we'll be looking at the rising cost of living and global supply chains. How has long lockdown changed global trade? But first, let's have a look at the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking dry and clear for many, but there could be a few showers in southern England. Let's take a look at the details. Rather cloudy to end the day across southwest England, there could be spots of rain and scattered showers push in from the channel. Skies will also be cloudy to end the day in southeast England. There could be spots of light rain here and there, but it should stay dry for most here. A dry end to the day in Wales as well, with largely clear skies. It will turn chilly after the sun sets. Patchy cloud will push into the Midlands this evening, but it will stay dry across the region. Skies will clear later and it will be chilly in the countryside. Staying mostly dry across northern England, but a brisk coastal wind will push a few showers into the northeast. Highs of 19 degrees Celsius. Staying mostly dry across northern England, but a brisk coastal wind will push a few showers into the northeast and over to Scotland. Clear skies will clear skies across Scotland this evening, breezy around the coast, but lighter winds inland. It'll be a dry end to the day in Northern Ireland with plenty of clear spells here. Showers in the south will ease tonight, leaving most places dry in the early hours. Chilly tonight, particularly in the countryside. And that's how the weather's shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. We're now going to give you an update on the rising cost of shipping and transport that is feeding the cost of living crisis. Is it part of the lasting legacy of lockdown? I think it might be. This report is from GB News reporter Ed Crawford. On the waters beyond Britain's coastline, there is a storm on the horizon. When the world descended into lockdowns in 2020, millions of people stuck at home began ordering unprecedented amounts of products online. 
Retailers posted record profits with Amazon's revenue raising by 38% to more than £318 billion. The surge in online spending created a gold rush in the cargo shipping industry, with container fleets keen to facilitate this burgeoning trend. Simon Heaney, who works for Drury Shipping Consultancy, has witnessed this maritime economic boom firsthand. The latest earnings season that just went by for the first quarter, carriers were able to post operating margins of approximately 60%. Prior to this, they, were, they would have been happy with 3%, frankly, and often they made a small loss. So it's night and day in terms of, of what's happened. So uh, container lines absolutely are, are the winners in terms of this pandemic. The rising consumer demand led to higher prices, with producers vying to get stock on board any vessel going. Some exporters' attitude was get it to Europe no matter what, and as a result, the prices more than tripled within a year, leaving the consumers with higher costs. Others in the industry remember the exponential rise in prices. If we look at pre-COVID levels to the peak, which was September, October 2021, uh, rates increased for a standard 40-foot container, which is the kind of container that you'll see on the back of trucks going up and down the motorway, an increase from just shy of $2,000 to move that from Asia to Europe to $19,000 to the UK. And so that's almost a tenfold increase in that time. As well as increased demand driving the prices higher, the shipping industry had to contain with global issues like never before. The war in Ukraine, sanctions on Russia and a zero Covid policy in China has led to unforeseen disruptions in the supply chain. Shanghai has some of the largest ports in the world, so when the Chinese economic machine ground to a halt, the economic effects were instant. The existing global backlog of goods increased and the price for consumers continued to grow as demand outstripped supply. Shipping rates had gradually decreased while Shanghai was in lockdown, but now China is opening up and shipping analysts say onboard container availability will diminish and once again the global supply chains will be pushed to the limit. It seems no one can predict which way the tide will turn, but with the shipping rates likely to continue rising, this will lead to higher prices trickling down to the consumer. Ed Crawford, GB News. Hi, it's me, Emily Carver, back on Real Britain. Lots of you have been getting in touch today about what I've been saying about the unions and that brilliant uh, interview I had with Stephen Pound, the former Labour MP. So, Dam says unions are dinosaurs who have their own self-interest at heart and not the workers. You know, I think I do agree with that. I think they've also want to fundamentally change this country and bring in some kind of socialist utopia, as Stephen was saying. I'm hoping that that won't happen. Lee says, unions are useless. My husband and I have been in a union all our working life. Right, so they've been in a union all their working life, but they're useless. Well, maybe you should think about leaving that union or perhaps, uh, I don't know, talking to your union leader who's probably on a six-figure salary. Nicholas said, it's quite clear that the unions are conspiring against the government, but Boris must stand up against them irrespective of the disruption. You know, people have been worried about Boris Johnson. He had his vote of confidence, which was pretty slim majority in favour of him staying on as the Prime Minister. I think this is right. He needs to actually prove that he can put his foot down. You know, the Rwanda policy has been a disaster so far. He hasn't been able to get the flight off the ground. If he can stand up to the unions and actually act in favour of most people in this country rather than a vocal minority of workers, I think he'll be a better. So I think he definitely should do that and do his job. So. You're with GB News on TV and DAB Radio. Next, we'll be discussing the children of lockdown who are now starting school with stunting learning, stunted learning and even speech. Now it's time for a check on the news headlines with Bethany Elsie. Thanks, Emily. It's almost 2.30. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. The Transport Secretary is accusing rail unions of punishing millions of innocent people over the planned national strikes next week. Thousands of rail workers will strike on Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. Grant Shapps says the RMT union has ignored requests to negotiate a resolution. The union claims its members have now taken a 20% pay cut amid rising inflation. 
The Labour leader says the Tories are hoarding power in the capital, which is directly linked to the cost of living crisis. Speaking in Coventry, Sakia Starmer warned the government's levelling up plans will fail if they don't devolve power outside of Whitehall. The levelling up secretary, Michael Gove, has previously said it's essential to address the UK's regional inequalities. The new head of the British Army has warned his troops must prepare to fight in Europe as the war continues in Ukraine. General Sir Patrick Sanders wrote to soldiers about the challenges they face. He said it's imperative to build an army that's capable of fighting against Russia. Well, after he returned from his trip to Ukraine's capital yesterday, the Prime Minister said, we need to steel ourselves for a long war. In France, voting is underway in the second and final round of the French parliamentary elections. President Emmanuel Macron, who was re-elected in April against Marine Le Pen, needs 289 seats for a majority in Parliament. But pollsters say his centrist group may fall short as smaller parties make gains. Macron's party won the first round of elections last Sunday, whilst left-wing alliance came second. Car insurance fell to its lowest level in more than six years in the first quarter of this year. The Association of British Insurers found the average price was £416, the lowest number since 2015. That's despite pressures from rising costs and supply chain problems exacerbated by the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. On TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Don't go anywhere, we'll get back to Emily in just a moment. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, welcome back to Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. It's now 2.34 p.m. in the afternoon. I hope you're having a great afternoon. So the Prime Minister has been in Ukraine this week. Following the trip, Boris Johnson said he hopes next year's Eurovision can be held in Ukraine, all the big issues the Prime Minister talking about, of course, not the UK, as had been reported. However, he missed a levelling up conference, which has proven a little bit controversial, to say the least, in Doncaster, in order to attend the Ukraine meetings. He angered quite a lot of his own northern MPs by doing so. Meanwhile, his Rwanda illegal migrant plan is in tatters after the intervention of a European court. And he's under fire for the UK's historically high tax burden. So, how can he please his MPs and start to ease the cost of living crisis? With me now is senior reporter and friend of the show. He's senior reporter at Guido Forks, that is. That's Christian Calgi, a man with his ear to the ground in Westminster. How are you, Calgi? I'm very well, thanks for having me on. 
So you're probably doing a bit better than Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister. What is going to be going on this week and how angry are these Northern MPs? Is this just tittle-tattle or are they actually very quite angry about how he went to Ukraine instead of seeing the North? Yeah, it's quite a split mood and it's certainly noticeable that this visit to Ukraine uh, has not been the PR coup that his first visit was, of course, cutting quite a trailblazing image when he was the first uh, first sort of Western leader to, to go and visit Zelensky. This time, very much more mixed, precisely because of, of the uh, day's events that he missed in order to go. Now, I don't think anyone uh, doubts the need for secrecy uh, when you're visiting a war-torn country. Uh, but it was a peculiar move, move by Boris, not only to miss... Uh, this very important Northern Research Group conference in Doncaster, but also to cancel uh, a scheduled visit to Wakefield ahead of this very important by-election. Now, you know, I think a lot of people are probably uh, quite accurately making money on the betting markets that Wakefield is a no hope for the Tory party. But even so, to cancel, uh, I think at this point, his only set visit uh, days ahead of the by-election is a very interesting move. Now, I think a lot of uh, a lot of Northern MPs, Red Wall MPs, are only too happy to anonymously brief left-wing journalists with uh, very flowery quotes, damning the Prime Minister's decision. On the other hand, you know, we've seen uh, from a wide array of the party people defending the move. I mean, you had Deanna Davison on this morning who uh, actually voted against the Prime Minister in the Vote No Confidence uh, earlier this month. Uh, saying it was the right decision to go to Ukraine. Obviously, you've had ministers like the Teesside MP Simon Clark defending it, Ben Wallace, Defence Secretary, uh, and I think the Metro Mayor of Teesside, Ben Houchen. So you've got a lot of people actually coming on the record and saying it was the right decision. But questions remain, you know, why that day in particular? Why promise that you were going to appear if presumably, you know, this... Uh, this decision operationally would have had to have been made 24 hours in advance or so. So you do get a lot of people's hopes up and you do sort of question maybe Abby, he could it, have gone the day after. It does seem mm. like he can't do anything right at the moment. You know, I'm as angry as anyone about the tax burden and what I see as a bit of a lack of direction, to say the least, about our economy, for one. But he's getting it in the ear on absolutely everything. You know, Lord Geit having resigned from his position. No one had even heard of Lord Guy, or at least they hadn't even heard that we even had an ethics advisor. I was quite surprised that we even had one. This was one of those jobs that was created by Tony Blair in 2006, I think. Is that going to have any lasting damage, or do you think that's just, uh, you know, that's just was in the papers for a couple of days and that's, that's finished? Or do you think that will make some lasting damage in people's minds, even more so? I think there are some stories that... Um, you know, people might not remember the specifics. I doubt anyone in the country knows Lord Guy's name. Uh, I don't think this is one of those stories that people are going to remember when it comes to voting in the ballot box at the next election. Um, but, you know, there's a big question mark for me over the number 10 operation in the handling of the resignation. Because, you know, the, the news came out, I think it was Tuesday night um, or Wednesday night. And then it was, you know, it was noon the next day before actually we found out that the specific reason he'd resigned over was, uh, you know, trying to, the government essentially putting up trade barriers to, in their words, protect British steel. Now, I think a lot of Tory MPs would have been really happy if Number 10 had got on the front foot on the night of uh, Lord Guy's resignation and actually spelt this out because when you know, voters were to hear about the specifics of why the guy resigned. I think, especially in the Red Wall, they'd be, well, you know, good on the government. You know, I know, I know you and I are a bit more free market and perhaps are uh, opposed to what the government's doing on, on trade protectionism with steel. But, you know, it, again, the government has a lot of problems. And you say it's... Boris can't get anything right. But, yeah, I mean, I think Boris know. Johnson is a bit of a centrist populist at the moment. Um, and so oh. it was actually quite clever that he could appeal to the sort of mainstream um, public with uh, that reasoning for the resignation, at least. Now, you have the pleasure or uh, the displeasure, as some people might say, of speaking to Tory MPs all the time. Have they calmed down a bit? 
Have they calmed down a bit since the vote of confidence? Or has this, this northern powerhouse or levelling up conference, you know, made people angry again? You know, is he going to continue to get a kicking from his colleagues? Or is there a sense that actually we've got to unify, we've got these big rail strikes coming, we've got the BMA, we've got the teachers' unions, we've got everyone sort of on our case. Are they beginning to see the bigger picture and maybe, you know, let's stick together and then we can battle the next election? What do you get? What, what sort of are you hearing on the ground? I, I don't... I, uh, there's a sense in which things have calmed down, but I don't think that's because they're getting behind the Prime Minister. I don't think any of the 148 uh, Tory MPs who voted against him, I don't think any of them have changed their minds. Indeed, the only way it's sort of calmed down, I guess, is that uh, in, a, in the minds of a lot of Tory MPs, the question is no longer, will Boris stay? It's preparing for a successor. Uh, now, that may or may not be true, there's an awful lot of scheming. There's a lot of people, you know, casting nets out, trying to get soundings for potential leadership bids. So, you know, the only way it's calmed down is not good news for, for Downing Street. It's just that a lot of Tory MPs have sort of banked the, the vote of no confidence as sort of the beginning of the end and are now sort of looking ahead to the next leader. Now, you know, I, for one, I'm not entirely confident that that is the case. You know, we've got to remember, unlike uh, a lot of other prime ministers that won vote no confidence uh, votes, but then sort of went very soon after. Uh, the only way Boris Johnson is leaving Downing Street is kicking and screaming and, you know, trying to cling on to the furniture. Yeah, so let's I see don't if he think manages this, this, to do that. He, Calgary, we've got to go to the next... He's not just going to take a message. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Calgi. Thanks so much for your time. That was great. That was senior reporter at Guido Fawkes, Christian Calgi, and also a friend of the show. So, welcome back to uh, Real Britain. I'm here for the rest of the hour until 4 p.m. Thank you for watching. So, welcome back. A year-long inquiry into the state of education in the UK by the Times Newspapers Education Commission has revealed children are arriving at school, believe it or not, unable to say their own names drink from cups, or even be toilet trained. So poor parenting was found to be part of the problem, but the pandemic has made the situation worse in many schools, it has been claimed at least. A YouGov poll of teachers by the early years charity Kindred Squared recently found that the proportion of pupils starting in reception who weren't ready for school had risen to 46% in 2020, up from 35% the previous year. Yeah, joining me now is Conservative commentator, former teacher and GB News contributor and fan favourite Calvin Robinson. Thank you so much for joining me today. Anytime, Emily. Really nice to have you on. So what on earth, you've been a teacher, what on earth is going wrong here? Is this lazy, negligent parents? Is this the lockdown, meaning that young kids aren't able to talk in the same way as they used to because they're simply not haven't had that interaction in the last two years. What do you think is going on? There's a lot going on here, but we've seen this. It's been progressive for years and years. For a long time, people have been saying, how come kids are leaving school without being able to read and write? And it, it's, what it's actually done is there's been a shift, a cultural shift from parenthood to statehood, from the child belonging to the parents and being the responsibility of the parents to belonging and being the responsibility of the state. There's an expectation now that it's the school's job to educate the child. Now, a school is supposed to be supplemental. It's supposed to support the parent. It's the parent's job. It's the parent's right and responsibility to educate a child. And we've forgotten that somehow. And I think a lot of this actually stems from uh, neo-Marxism, because we know that the, 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 whole, the old Marxist methodology of breaking down our way of life, our institutions, and our society is to start with the family unit and destroy the family unit. And over the years, we've seen that movement away from family to the state. So at the other end of the spectrum, so we've talked about when kids are leaving school and we're saying why can't they read and write well it's because it's not just up to the teachers you know you've got to prepare them for you've got to prepare them as parents you want to read to them read with them as parents but on the other end of the spectrum we're now seeing it more prevalent when kids are being sent to school when kids first start school you know you mentioned that a lot of kids don't know how to use a toilet and you know i've talked to some people that i consider close and they've said well you know my kid is going to get nappy trained soon because because they're off to uh reception or they're off to nursery school. I'm like, what, what do you mean? That's your job. To, no, 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 the, the schools do that. You know, it's part of their, oh, no, no, it's not whether they do it or not. It's whether they should be doing it or not. Schools should not be teaching your children to use the toilet. That is a parent's job.
I mean, it's quite extraordinary. It's hard to imagine. I mean, I was very lucky growing up. I had two very supportive parents who taught me to read by, you know, age four. I was reading books and I was very much able to say my own name. And I really do, really do feel for these children who simply aren't being raised in, in an appropriate way, really. It's just not good enough. And as you say, we can't rely on teachers to be care workers, social care workers, parent, absolutely everything for these young children. You know, in the Times report today, I'm sure you've read, you know, they're calling for a five a day initiative to encourage parents to talk to and play with their children, similar to the healthy eating campaign we have on, you know, five fruits and veg a day. Have we really got to a situation where parents need to be told to read and talk to their children? I mean, Seriously, do you think that this actually is a time where the government needs to step in and actually say, no, you know, no, give tools? No. You, or... the, problem is, the problem is that the government's been stepping in far too often. So this is not parents' fault. Parents have been guided away from parenting because we expect the state to take responsibility and to step in and to fix every issue. It's not the government's job to fix all society's issues. It's the job of the government to protect our nation, to protect our borders and to protect our security. That is it. And what we do here is we look at a problem, we say, how can the government solve that? And the government tries to solve the problem and makes things worse. But this is not parents' fault. This is actually, if anything, it's the state, but also teachers' fault. Far too often, I've spoken to my peers, my colleagues in schools who said, well, of course we have to teach our values to children, because what if they go home and, and they're, they're living with people that have the wrong values? It's this idea that actually teachers know better than parents. And of course, that's not the case. Parents know what is best for their own child. Right now, the Department for Education is putting together a policy, the schools bill, a tr tremendously disgustingly bad policy that it takes more power away from parents and gives more power to the state, in fact, to the DfE, that actually fundamentally means that the child belongs to the state. So, for example, homeschooling or home educating, as it's called in this country, is vitally important because if parents don't want their kids to be woke, indoctrinated in schools, then they want to take them home and educate them themselves, they should have that right. Now the government is looking at how to address homeschooling so that um, so that kids aren't missing, as they call them, from schools. And I think that's a fundamental shift in the way we see parenting yeah. and the way we see education. And I think a lot of parents during the lockdown were shocked, actually, at the level of teaching their children were receiving over the Zoom. They got an insight into the classes, what they were like, what issues were being taught, those sort of woke issues that were being taught and prioritised over the basics. You know, there's also reports, I don't know if you've seen from The Telegraph, about Ofsted, the school's inspector. They're citing a lack of gender identity lessons as factor in primary school grading. So essentially, if schools aren't teaching enough about gender identity and gender diversity, that these schools could be being marked down on Ofsted grading because of that. I mean, what on earth are we doing in this country? Why is Ofsted even thinking about gender identity in primary schools? Indeed. Schools should be teaching reading, writing and arithmetic. It's very simple, really. Anything that's based on values, anything that's based on ideology should not belong in a school. Schools already under the law, under the 1996 Education Act, have to be politically neutral. Under the teachers' standards, teachers have to be politically neutral. And governors and head teachers are responsible for making sure that they are and help, holding them to account. But it's not always the case. And the Ofsted, actually, it's not part of their policy, it's not part of their procedure to look at these woke indoctrination values. But, of course, many of the inspectors happen to be woke and looking to indoctrinate children as well. There are lots of activist teachers, lots of activist inspectors. That's what we need to be clamping down on. If the government wants to get involved in anything in education, that's what they need to be looking at, making sure that schools are staying way away from values and making sure that they are politically neutral. Ideologies like critical race theory, gender theory, and all of these nonsense are kept well away from vulnerable uh, young minds. It does seem to me that in this country, we're, we're not run by the government. We're run by rules and regulators, regulation, etc., that seem to be able to get in there and go against government policy, particularly as, as you said, the Education Secretary is trying to clamp down on exactly that. Thank you so much, Calvin, for joining me today on the show. That was Conservative commentator Calvin Robinson. So now the housing crisis is showing no signs of abating, unfortunately, with spiralling prices and increased interest rates on the way to... We are the rental generation, a lot of us anyway, a lot of millennials and Gen Z. 
can't think of a time when they're going to be owning their own home. It's, only, it's the only viable option for many, really, renting a flat at extortionate prices. The government's new rental white paper, which was released this week, does include a number of new rights for tenants. They're trying to make things better for people renting, essentially, like challenging rent increases in tribunals, stopping landlords, blanket banning pets, and a pledge to outlaw no-fault evictions. So have renters' rights really improved? And will this new policy help the young? Or is this a socialist crackdown on landlords, as former Brexit minister Lord Frost wrote this week? Joining me now to discuss this is journalism, media and culture student at Newcastle University, Adam Wildsmith, and also Nina Skinner, a social policy and politics student at Bristol. Hi, guys. Thank you for joining me. Thank Hello. you. So, uh, Louise, Nina, sorry, are you going to be having a pet? Are you delighted with these reforms? Um, unfortunately, I can't say that I will be having a pet anytime <laughs> soon, but I am delighted to know that I will not be moving into a property two weeks from now that is in a state of disrepair, which I was unfortunate enough to uh, have experienced this year. So I do think that I and the 11 million other renters around the country will definitely benefit. Can you just give, because we see these adverts about properties um, for rent and they are extreme. You know, you have a bed next to a fridge, next to a hob, next to the toilet right next to you. And it's, you know, it's a thousand pounds a month, uh, excluding bills, um, that sort of thing that goes around the internet. But it's very true. What's the worst thing that you've seen in terms of the rental market? Well, the worst thing that I've seen personally is a friend of mine um, went to view a student flat, the ceiling of which was absolutely covered in mould. Now, that definitely constitutes a risk to health and safety and therefore would be covered under the decent home standard when that is expanded to the private rental sector when the rent reform bill goes through. So, um, you know, as a renter myself, being surrounded mostly by other renters, I'm seeing very, very tangible issues which could be solved in a very easy way, most of which is covered by this plan. And that's why I wholeheartedly support it. Adam, could you uh, tell our listeners and viewers what your worst experience is or something that you know of? I'm sure you've rented, um, unless you're still at university, you're probably in student housing. Um, what's the worst sort of situation you've come across? Because I think it is bad. And I think as much as I think that it's important that we keep landlords in the game, we don't want to make it so difficult for landlords that they um, remove their properties from the market altogether. But there is a real situation, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important also that, uh, as we need to establish, not all landlords are thugs and <laughs> not all bad people, but it is important to, for them to take accountability for the properties that are renting to tenants. The government's own figures this week showed that, um, you know, 12% of properties are actually in a non-decent condition for tenants and people shouldn't be paying to live in properties that could cause serious illness. And it was £360 million a year we're spending on the National Health Service to treat illnesses from non-decent properties. So there is a serious knock-on effect. So I think it is welcome that the government's introducing a new independent ombudsman that tenants can complain to if there are serious problems with their properties. This all sort of hiding the fact that we simply have a housing supply crisis. So things would be so much better, people would have more choice there'd be more supply to meet demand. People would be able to pick and choose which rental properties they lived in if only the government would reform planning and let us build more housing. Absolutely. Well, the government has... Oh, more. sorry, Nina first, and then we'll go to you, Adam. That's right. So I certainly do agree that more housing is needed and there have been plans announced on that. It's not an either or issue for me. We can make the housing that we've got safe while simultaneously acknowledging that we need to build more. One um, proposal in this, in this white paper, which does address the supply issue to an extent, is the fact that it allows tenants to move on to flexible rolling contracts as opposed to fixed term contracts, which then means that people are not you know, living in houses that are too big for them just because they have a lease that they have to pay or vice versa, you know, couples can move in together when they want, not when their lease allows. And that will mean that the housing that we've got can be used more efficiently, which should, uh, I'm not going to go as far as to say it will reduce prices, but it may well um, slow or halt the increase. Adam, are you worried at all that uh, scrapping Section 21, that's the no-fault eviction, might force landlords out of the market? Because, you know, just as there can be unscrupulous landlords, there can be pretty rubbish, terrible tenants. Uh, that landlords shouldn't have to uh, keep in their homes if they're just not paying the rents on time, if they're not treating the building properly. What do you think about that? Do you think there could be some unintended consequences? 
Well, the bill already, um, as it's going to be proposed, um, pledges that there will be reforms for landlords to make it easier to evict tenants who don't pay their rent. Um, but it's also important that the Section 21, which is, of course, only two months' notice, it can be difficult for tenants, particularly at the poor end of the scale, to save up the relevant um, uh, money that would be needed to pay for a new deposit on, on a new rental property. So it is important for it to be fair on both ends of the spectrum, whereby a, a landlord can evict a tenant who isn't paying the rent, isn't looking after the property. But also at the same end of the, the argument, the, the, the tenant is able to afford to move to another property if they're evicted at short notice by their landlord, which of course is what the bill intends to scrap. So a very, very quick question, very quick question before I leave. When do you both think that you're going to own your own property? How old do you think you'll be, Nina, first? At least in mid-30s. Mid-30s, Adam? I'd probably agree, yes. I don't think any time soon. Mid-30s. Apparently, the average is 29 at the moment, which is far older than it used to be. Thank you so much, Nina Skinner and Adam Wildsmith. That was very, very interesting. Great to have you on, as always. So you're watching Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. Stay with us for the second half of the show. And please do keep sending in your views and opinions. I really like to read them out when I get the chance. But first, it's the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry and clear for many, but there could be a few showers in southern England. Let's take a look at the details. It will be a cloudy end to the day across the southwest of England. There could be spots of rain as showers push in from the Channel. Skies will be cloudy to end of the day in the southeast of England as well. There could be spots of light rain here and there, but it should stay dry for most. It will be a dry end to the day in Wales, with largely clear skies here but it winter will turn chilly after the sun sets. Highs of 19 degrees. Patchy cloud will push into the Midlands this evening, but it will stay dry across the region. Skies will clear later and it will be chilly in the countryside. It'll stay mostly dry across northern England through the evening, but a brisk coastal wind will push a few showers to, to the northeast. Highs of 19 here. There'll be clear skies across Scotland this evening, breezy around the coasts, but lighter winds inland. It'll turn chilly tonight with lows of two degrees in some spots. It will be a dry end to the day in Northern Ireland with plenty of clear spells here. Highs of 17. Showers in the south will ease tonight, leaving most places dry in the early hours. Chilly tonight, particularly in the countryside. And that's how the weather's shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, and the left fights the right, and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was, in fact, a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News.
I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to the show. This is Real Britain with me, Emily Carver, on TV, DAB and online. In this hour, we'll be discussing why taxes are so blimmin' high in the UK, why one council is blaming weeds on Brexit, believe it or not, and I'll be joined by Rod Little, the brilliant columnist, to discuss whether Glastonbury is too white. Uh, OK. But first, it's the news with Bethany Elsie. Thanks, Emily. Good afternoon. It's just gone three o'clock. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. The Transport Secretary is accusing rail unions of punishing millions of innocent people over the planned national strikes next week. Thousands of rail workers will go on strike on Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. Grant Shapp says the RMT union has ignored requests to negotiate a resolution. The union claims its members have now taken a 20% pay cut amid rising inflation. Labour claim the government want the strikes to go ahead to stoke political divisions. And RMT's former Assistant General Secretary, Steve Headley, told GB News he agrees with Labour. They want the distraction from soaring fuel prices, from the cost of living crisis, and uh, they want to take on the unions. It's a great distraction. It's red meat for the Tory voters. Uh, they rally the party faithful. So I think we do, and I think this uh, strike's really avoidable. I think we should be... Uh, still around the negotiating table, but rather than negotiate in good faith with the unions, SAP seems more interested in uh, the latest soundbite in the press. The Labour leader says Tories are hoarding power in the capital, which is directly linked to the cost of living crisis. Speaking in Coventry, Sakir Starmer warned the government's levelling up plans will fail if they don't devolve power outside of Whitehall. The levelling up secretary, Michael Gove, has previously said it's essential to address the UK's regional inequalities. Sakir said Labour, a Labour government would end one-year funding settlements to ensure councils have more stable income. Hoarding power has consequences. The Tory economic record is terrible. Low growth for 12 years. Stagnant wages. And the reason for this is we're not making the most of every part of our country. We're squandering the potential in our towns, in our cities, in our coastal areas and our rural communities, all the places that you represent. We're squandering the potential. The new head of the British Army has warned his troops must prepare to fight in Europe as the war continues in Ukraine. General Sir Patrick Sanders said it's imperative to build an army that's capable of fighting against Russia. After returning from his trip to Ukraine's capital yesterday, the Prime Minister said we need to steel ourselves for a long war. General Sir Richard Barons told GB News the British Army is facing the most profound transformation of defence and security for more than 100 years. Well, the digital age is changing um, the way you fight wars and it's not just drones and missiles and precision, it's about robotics and autonomy and, and, and biosciences. So the Chief of General Staff has to change his army to deal with a much higher level of threat and he has to transform it for the digital age and he needs to tell his people that and he needs government to help him do it. In France, voting is underway in the second and final round of the French parliamentary elections. President Emmanuel Macron, who was re-elected in April against Marine Le Pen, needs 289 seats for a majority in Parliament. But pollsters say his centrist group may fall short as smaller parties make gains. Macron's party won the first round of elections last Sunday, whilst the left-wing alliance came in second. Car insurance fell to its lowest level in more than six years in the first quarter of this year. The Association of British Insurers found the average price was £416, the lowest number since 2015. That's despite pressures from rising costs and supply chain problems exacerbated by the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. 
A teaching union says it will ballot its 460,000 members for strike action if they're not offered a pay rise within three days. The National Education Union told The Observer wages need to be increased closer to inflation by next Wednesday. It said an initial ballot would be taken to gauge reactions. Then a second might be issued specifically on whether to take industrial action. Any strikes could take place in the autumn. A loan that provides emergency funds to the most financially vulnerable will be offered to 20,000 people. The no-interest loan scheme is backed by the government but run by credit unions and other lenders. It'll help people who would have otherwise been denied a loan buy things like laptops, school uniforms and household essentials. The scheme is being trialled in Manchester and will be rolled out to other parts of the UK from September. And Olympic champion Dame Kelly Holmes has shared her relief at publicly coming out as gay. The 52-year-old told the Sunday Mirror she's known since she was 17 but kept it a secret for decades, living in fear of repercussions as she was in the army. The two-time Olympic gold medalist said hiding it has caused mental health issues. And although she's nervous, she's also excited the news is out. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now, though, let's get back to Emily. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. Here's what's coming up in this hour. Lenny Henry has been complaining that Glastonbury Festival is too white. I mean, talk about small issues, sweating the small stuff. Anyway, Rod Little will join me to discuss that. He's written a rather amusing column, as he does so well. And why is Brighton's left-wing Green Party-led council blaming Brexit for the spread of weeds. I mean, you can really blame anything on Brexit, can't you? I'll speak to a local politician about that. And Love Island is back and it's gripping the nation. I must admit, I do watch it. And this year, it's getting political. Stay tuned for that. That's what we'll be talking about for the next hour. I'd love to know your thoughts on tax. Is it too high and why isn't the government cutting it? They talk about it all the time. They say, we're going to cut taxes. We're going to bring down that burden. We're on your side. But yet, they still won't. Tweet me at Carver Emily or at GB News, or you can email me as well on GBviews at GBnews.uk. We've got lots of your views coming in already. Remember, you can watch us online too on YouTube. And don't forget Facebook. You'll find lots of brilliant content on the GB News page. Thank you very much for watching. So, UK households are soon set to be saddled with the heaviest tax burden since the 1940s. I think we're already there, to be honest. Even when Chancellor Rishi Sunak's income tax cut and national insurance tweaks are baked in. In fact, Britain's fiscal watchdog is forecasting the tax burden to hit 36.3% in four years' time. We are the only G7 nation hiking taxes like national insurance in the middle of the current cost of living crisis. So, in this hour, I'm simply asking why. How much damage is such a large tax burden doing? Joining me now is former co-head for the Government Economic Service, Vicky Price, President of the Association of Women Entrepreneurs, Louise Oliver, and Gerard Lyons, Chief Economic Strategist at NetWealth and former Economic Advisor to Boris Johnson when he was Mayor of London. I think, Gerard, we've got to start with you, as he was your former boss. You know him pretty well, I imagine. Why isn't he cutting taxes? He says he wants to. Well, I think the challenge for the Prime Minister is that he's listening too much to the Chancellor and the Chancellor is too much in the grip, shall we say, of the Treasury. The reality, though, if one wants to step back from that, is that the UK faces two economic problems. One is a higher inflation problem and the other is an economic slowdown, which could easily lead to recession. So in answer to your question, the Prime Minister and the Chancellor are very much focused on addressing that inflation problem. And I don't think they're focusing as much as they should do on addressing the downside risks and preventing recession. I certainly think there should be an easier fiscal stance in terms of what taxes we should be cutting. We can discuss that in a moment. They would argue that they are doing some things. For instance, they're increasing allowances in a few weeks' time so people will start to pay national insurance not at £192 a week, but when they hit £240 a week. So people on low incomes will feel the benefit of that in particular. But overall, I think there has been too much of a focus on fighting inflation 
as opposed to an increased focus on fighting recession. It's understandable we have to fight inflation. We need the tighter monetary policy. But to address the downside risks and fight recession, I think we need to see an easier fiscal stance and in particular lower tax. Vicky, isn't that the, the point, really? You know, we talk about the cost of living, but taxes are one of, if not the biggest cost of living burden for ordinary people in this country. Would it not make sense to t cut taxes now, go for growth, and that will sort out the economy? I think the worry that the government has, just as Gerald was describing, is that if you do that and you just you know, try and stimulate the economy right now, then you might end up with a lot more inflation. And that's a problem which affects a lot of people at the lower end of the pay scale. So we mustn't forget inflation is not good news for them. And what is happening, of course, right now is that the costs that they have to face are considerably greater for those in the lower pay scale because they spend more of their incomes or whatever they may have in terms of uh, benefits that they receive on essentials. And those essentials are food and energy. About those things, monetary policy cannot do a lot. Raising interest rates isn't going to make much difference to that. It's going to take quite some time for it to have a real impact on inflation. So you could argue that we have a slightly misbalanced you know, set of policies, one a sort of monetary policy which is tightening and one a fiscal policy which, strangely enough, has indeed been tightening except for the giveaways that we've seen in the last uh, couple of months where there's been an extra 37 billion given to people, particularly uh, a redirection of money to the lower paid, but also cut in fuel duty. So, yes, indeed, taxes matter. Uh, but the more important thing right now for everybody is just the cost that they are facing. Reducing possibly income tax by one base point isn't really going to make a huge difference in that. What might make a difference is if you reduce taxes in a different way, such as possibly VAT, reducing VAT across the board, the way that we did at the time of the financial crisis, will indeed bring prices down, readjusting some of the way in which we pay for electricity at home to reduce some of the burden there. Look at particular sectors of the economy as we had done before. For example, we had in hospitality a reduction in VAT, which was temporary. So there are all sorts of areas where you can intervene and reduce the cost, the immediate cost to consumers. Doing something on the tax front isn't going to make much difference, in my view, in the short term. Louise, do you, would, do you agree with what Vicky has to say? Would you, do you fear that some tax cuts could be inflationary? In my view, I think the Bank of England has proven itself to be slightly asleep at the wheel when it comes to managing inflation. I think they're trying now to sort of incrementally raise those interest rates, but I think maybe it's a little uh, too little too late at this point. How do you think the government should be cutting the cost of living? Should they be focusing more on bringing down uh, regulatory burdens? Uh, Emily, I totally agree with uh, Vicky. Uh, I think that reducing income tax by, you know, one um, percent, people won't feel that. And the Chancellor has um, promised a one percent increase in income tax, but not until next year. Um, there are other ways, and Vicky alluded to these, that you can help people immediately, and that would be, in my opinion, that the five P on uh, duty at the pumps has literally not been noticed. So I feel that that could uh, help people immediately. There's also VAT. So when we look at the price of filling our um, cars with fuel, there's 52p goes in duty and 30p in VAT. So the government can do something about that. They're benefiting from this at the minute. It's a quick win. They should really think about that. Also, this miserable green levy that we have on our household energy bills. I mean, that's £153 a year on average for households. And I think that, yes, we do need to invest in, in green energy, but maybe now's not the time. The other thing that I worry about is next year, tax is going up on business. Our corporation tax rate is going up from 19%. Yeah, I think people, I think most people who don't run their own businesses don't understand the impact that will have on uh, potentially pay, on recruitment, on profit margins, on, uh, you know, consumers, on consumer prices. That won't just be felt by these, uh, you know, unknown corporations. It will trickle down to most people in this country working in the private sector. 
Gerard, I want to go back to what you said about this conflict between Rishi Sunak and the Prime Minister. I, and also, actually, you know, it has, has the Prime Minister got, him, got himself a little bit wedged here? He is advocating net zero. He wants to be seen as a green Prime Minister. But at the same time, we are seeing that these green pledges are very much costing us a lot and costing those at the bottom of the pile in terms of those costs on our bills. What do you think he's got to do then to balance both of those two issues he's got? Yeah, well, we need to face the immediate challenge in front of us, which is the inevitability of a slowdown in the economy and a possible recession. The best way to reduce uh, these challenges or to address them is to actually give the economy as much of a stimulus we can. And also it's important to actually push back on the Treasury in terms of their fears about the budget deficit. The best way for the budget deficit to be brought under control is stronger economic growth. So in answer to your question, I think we need three things on fiscal policy. First, we need to see timely, temporary and targeted measures to those people in difficulty. And we have started to see some of that. So a tick there. The second area, though, is coming back to what Vicky was saying, is about reducing the taxes on fuel and energy. And we haven't seen enough action there. So there's a cross there. VAT on fuel should be reduced. I agree with your other guest that we should temporarily suspend the green tax in terms of environmental tax on uh, energy, etc. Um, Germany has done that without any loss of green credentials. So there's a cross there in terms of what we can do. And the third area is the overall need to change tax to boost the supply side of the economy and to help the squeeze middle. In terms of helping the supply side of the economy, I think next spring's planned increase in corporation tax should be suspended. I think the superconductor that allows businesses to actually invest more, that should be made permanent. I think there should be a change on business levies to help small and medium-sized firms. And I do think income tax should be cut. If you're worried about inflation, then maybe wait until inflation Inflation has peaked this summer and cutting from tax in the autumn budget. But three areas, help to those people most in need. The government is doing that. They should be congratulated for that. Second, we should be reducing the tax temporarily maybe on energy and other types of fuel. We need to do a lot more there. And the third area is to actually suspend the corporation tax increase and cut income tax maybe later this year. There's and the, the Gerard Lyons that... manif manifesto for you. That's what needs to be done. Um, Vicky, you know what winds me up about this discussion about the cost of living is that we're always talking about how much more the government can spend, whether it comes to welfare benefits, subsidies, uh, council tax rebates, et cetera, et cetera. We're not looking at the ways in which the government are pushing up costs, not just with taxes, but also in terms of the hesitancy around any kind of planning reform, which obviously would help drive down housing costs, you know, child, uh, child care ratios for childcare minders. There's so many ways that the government itself is pushing up costs on businesses and individuals. I'd like to see the government get back to those free market routes. You know, they've been talking about how they're going to, but we're not seeing any action. Well, you've got a point there. The only trouble is that all these issues take a long time to have an impact. Mm. You can change the planning rules. It's going to take quite some time for more houses to be built. And then, of course, you can have all sorts of other changes that you can make to the to any other system that of the type that you mentioned, which, uh, again, you know, might take two or three years to have an effect. Whereas what might actually work more is if you do something directly now for businesses themselves. So you've seen energy intensive sectors not really being helped. You've seen the whole airline industry and the travel industry, which wasn't supported for six months, even though there were still restrictions. We lifted the furlough scheme uh, in, uh, in, the, in the autumn, but in fact, restrictions on uh, traveling were not lifted until about March. So that's a serious issue, I think, for businesses which have had to deal with these changes around them with very little support from the government specific support with sectors absolutely needed. Louise, I'd just like to give you the last word as we've only got a few seconds left. Will you tell me what you'd like to see from the Prime Minister just very quickly? I'd like to see, as I said, the, uh, the tax, uh, the VAT at the pumps and the duty addressed. That's a quick fix thought for them. And to think through their policies, the policies are half-baked they're done on the hoof. Uh, so they need proper planning. And as I said previously, invest in business. 
Yes, I mean, it's quite extraordinary that now it's the case that apparently, according to polling, people think the Labour Party are the party of low taxes. I mean, that's a shocking PR um, situation, I think, for the Conservative Party. That's one thing they've usually got going for them. Thank you so much for joining me, all three of you. That was former co-head for the Government Economic Service, Vicky Price, President of the Association of Women Entrepreneurs, Louise Oliver, and Cheek Chief Economic Strategist at NetWealth, Gerard Lyons. Plenty more to come to this come this afternoon on Real Britain. Next up, the local council blaming Brexit for weeds growing on the pavement, whatever next. But first, let's have a look at the weather. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. And we're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. Hello, happy Father's Day. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. So we're moving on to a slightly different topic. The proliferation of weeds on the pavement in the city of Brighton is due to labour and equipment shortages brought about by Brexit, the local council lies, sorry, claims. Really? Or could it be the result of the banning of pesticides back in 2019? As a result of this, the Green Party-led far-left local authority is now reportedly encouraging local residents to clean the streets themselves. What is going on? With me now is Conservative Brighton & Hove councillor for Patchum and Hollingbury, Alistair McNair. Thanks for joining me, Alistair. Thanks for having me, Emily. So what on earth is going on in Brighton with these weeds? Well, essentially, the Green Party just love having weeds. So I've been a councillor uh, for Patchum and Hollingbury, that's in North Brighton, since 2019. And every year we've been talking about this issue. But this year, it's particularly bad. Uh, I certainly don't blame Brexit. 
Uh, I mean, in my ward, we've got, uh, it's a suburban ward. There's lots of parks, there's lots of verges. There's lots of small areas of, of green where children should be able to play and residents should be able to walk their dogs. And they can't because it's covered in barley grass or the weeds are, you know, three or four foot high. Um, there's, there's litter there as well. It's, a, it's a very unsightly. It doesn't sound too good. I've seen some pictures in the press and it's uh, very overgrown, as our viewers uh, can see just there. We were just looking at some uh, videos of the weeds and they seem to have got, uh, well, particularly out of control. Now, I've read about Brighton Council quite a lot because I've been quite interested in how the Greens run things in the past. And it seems to be a litany of failures in terms of getting the basics right. So, of course, they're going to be there pictured in Brighton, uh, you know, when there's an Extinction Rebellion um, protest or the like, something where you can get a nice photo op, um, I imagine. But it seems like when it comes to boring things like uh, bin collections, they're not doing too well. Is that right? Yeah, bin collections, recycling, um, terrible. Uh, it's not getting any better. Um, a green party. Yeah, yeah. You would have, I mean, you would have thought, sorry, just to we're, stop we're, you there. Among the worst in the country. Sorry, just to stop you there. I mean, for a green party to get recycling wrong, I mean, that is pretty poor. You would have thought that would be number one top priority, or are they only looking at climate change as a whole rather than the basics? Well, we have had a, we have had a climate assembly here, which was a, a good experience. I was uh, involved in that. But yeah, they can't get the doorstep issues right. You step out your door, there's, there's litter everywhere, there's graffiti. Uh, it looks unsightly. You can't get your rubbish collected. Every day we're bombarded with the emails complaining about these things. Yeah, so and, I mean... And it's getting worse. I mean, you're a, you're a Conservative councillor, so you would probably want to stick the boot in. How many Tory councillors are there in, in Brighton? I can't imagine there'd be too many. Are you one of very few? Oh, well, we've got 12 councillors. We're the third okay. party in Brighton and Hove. So the Greens have got 20 and Labour have got 16. Yes, yeah, so I've been reading that uh, the Green Council are giving residents tools to deal with their own overgrown paths full of weeds. Now, I don't think I'd appreciate... I know, actually, I was listening uh, to the news the other day and they had on some Green Party councillor um, from there. And he said, oh, you know, the residents really enjoy doing the weeds themselves. And also, some of the residents also really like the appearance of the weeds. Um, and of course, I'm sitting there wondering, well, clearly not. People don't like weeds. OK, they might be a pretty one or two, but it does seem like the excuses ran out pretty quickly. No, uh, well, we've, we've raised this issue many times over the years. And honestly, green councillors will say, oh, yeah, we love the weeds. Weeds are wonderful. Well, I think the vast majority of residents are sick to death of seeing these weeds every, I mean, everywhere. Um, and I'm sure some, and lots of residents do cut their own verges. Uh, if, it, if it wasn't for that, it would be even worse. And I'm sure some residents would appreciate getting tools. But we have the, they always increase council tax by the highest possible amount. Now they're having to, uh, cut their own verges and dig up their own weeds with tools provided by the council, it does get a bit ridiculous. Thank you very much for joining me, Alistair. I hope uh, the weeds get sorted out. I think I'd probably bring back pesticides if it were me in charge, but uh, perhaps, perhaps I'm old-fashioned. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, so, yeah, I'm just having a look. We've got many, many views coming through um, off the back of my monologue on the unions. I'm just fed up of the same usual suspects always protesting absolutely everything and then attempting to drive our economy to the ground, our country to the ground, in a bid to just simply get rid of the government. So Emma says, the unions are definitely doing this to cause trouble to try and bring... The oh, that's exactly what I just said. Emma, you're absolutely spot on. Trying to bring the government down. Tony Blair and the Labour Party have their fingerprints all over this. I don't know about that, but it sounds pretty uh, spot on to me. Daryl says the RMT has always been extremely militant. That's what Stephen Pound, the former Labour, um, Labour MP, was saying. He was saying the RMT isn't representative of all unions, they are extremely militant. The train drivers shouldn't be allowed to strike. They are exceedingly well paid. Well, they are, aren't they? I think they get paid about 60 grand a year. I mean, that's...
pretty good going for us sitting in a train, I would say. And Dave says trade unions are, I'm afraid, an outdated concept with no value to today's industrial world. It does seem a bit like that. You know, most people have quite flexible work now. It does seem like they are stuck in the past. Thank you so much for your views. Please do keep uh, sending them in to, uh, you can tweet me at Carver Emily or at GB News. So you're with GB News on TV and DAB radio. Next is Glastonbury 2 White. We'll be joined by the one and only Rod Little to get into that. So stay with us. Now it's time for a check on the news headlines with Bethany Elsie. Thanks, Emily. Good afternoon. It's just gone half past three. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. The Transport Secretary is accusing rail unions of punishing millions of innocent people over the planned national strikes next week. Thousands of rail workers will go on strike on Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday. Grant Shapp says the RMT union has ignored requests to negotiate a resolution. The union claims its members have now taken a 20% pay cut amid rising inflation. The Labour leader says the Tories are hoarding power in the capital, which is directly linked to the cost of living crisis. Speaking in Coventry, Sakia Starmer warned the government's levelling up plans will fail if they don't devolve power outside of Whitehall. The levelling up secretary, Michael Gove, has previously said it's essential to address the UK's regional inequalities. The new head of the British Army has warned his troops must prepare to fight in Europe as the war continues in Ukraine. General Sir Patrick Sanders wrote to soldiers about the challenges they face. He said it's imperative to build an army that is capable of fighting against Russia. After he returned from his trip to Ukraine's capital yesterday, the Prime Minister said we need to steel ourselves for a long war. In France, voting is underway in the second and final round of the French parliamentary elections. Presidential Eman President Emmanuel Macron, who was re-elected in April against Marine Le Pen, needs a 289 seats for a majority in Parliament. But pollsters say his centrist group may fall short as smaller parties make gains. On TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. We'll get back to Emily in just a moment. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking dry and clear for many, but there could be a few showers in southern England. Let's take a look at the details. It will be cloudy to end the day across southwest England. There could be spots of rain as showers push in from the channel. Skies will also be cloudy to end the day in southeast England. There could be spots of light rain here and there, but it should stay dry for most. It should also be a dry end to the day in Wales, with largely clear skies here. It will turn chilly after the sun sets. Highs of 19 degrees. Patchy cloud will push into the Midlands this evening, but it will stay dry across the region. Skies will clear later and it will be chilly in the countryside. Staying mostly dry across northern England, but a brisk coastal wind will push a few showers towards the northeast. Highs of 19 here as well. It will be clear skies across Scotland this evening, breezy around the coastline, but lighter winds inland. Turning chilly tonight with lows of 2 degrees. It will be a dry end to the day in Northern Ireland with plenty of clear spells here. Lows of 13 and highs of 17 degrees. Showers in the south will ease tonight, leaving most places dry in the early hours. Chilly tonight, particularly in the countryside. That's how the weather's shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs>
Whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, and the left fights the right, and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was, in fact, a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. So, Sir Lenny Henry is worried about the number of white people at Glastonbury Festival. I mean, as if we've not got enough to worry about. Having been myself and witnessed the state of some of them, I am not too surprised, to be honest. But Henry was trying to make... I'm, having, I'm not sure what was going on with the auto cue there, but I have no idea what I was saying there, but we're moving on. Something about diversity. He said he is always surprised by the absence of black and Asian faces in the crowds. It's true, it is predominantly white people in the crowds, that's for sure. There are many possible reasons why this could be the case. The inevitable rain and post apocalypse political living condition, post-apocalyptic living condition, to name just a couple. My next guest has also got his theories. Joining me now to discuss is Associate Editor at The Spectator, Rod Liddell. Thank you for joining me, Rod. Hello, Rod. How are you doing? Did you, have you a doing? Nice, did you have a nice Father's Day lunch? Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Happy Father's Day. So why is Lenny Henry, A, worried about this, and B, why is Glastonbury so white? Well, I think it's a very, very important issue, and I've been thinking about it since I wrote a piece for The Spectator on it earlier in the week. And I think it's got to the point, it's got to the kind of crisis point that black people ought to be forced to go to Glastonbury, um, that they ought to be rounded up somehow and bussed uh, to Glastonbury uh, in order to watch an 80-year-old Paul McCartney singing his inclusive hit, Obla D, Obla Da. Um, I, I can't think of any other way, really. You know, we, we've got supposedly got equal rights in this country, supposedly the black people and Asian people, uh, because you don't see many uh, Muslims at Glastonbury either. Um, and I think it's time that we actually took very, very serious steps and actually, whether they want to go or not, drove them into Glastonbury and made them watch Sir Paul McCartney and uh, on occasions when he's available, Rolf Harris. Uh, and that, that's what, I can't see any any alternative to this yeah, at that's the moment, the type, I'm afraid. That's the type of action we must take, you know, this something must be done. But it's like the conversation about the countryside, isn't it? There were all these articles written about the, how the countryside is racist and all these worthy commentators talking about, oh, I don't know, perhaps it's too costly to get a bus to the countryside or perhaps, you know, some pub owners in the countryside might be a bit backward with some of their views. I mean, come on, people just have different preferences. You know, it reminds me of Jon Snow, who said, I think it was in 2019, when Brexit was supposed to happen, but then didn't happen, that he's never seen so many white people before. It did pass the Ofcom regulator test. But I mean, come on, what is wrong with these people? Well, Jon should really have had a look at Channel 4 News' uh, demographic. Uh, if, you, if you wanted to find something even more white uh, than the number of people who voted Glastonbury, that would be it. Uh, I mean, yeah, of course you're right. some introspection, likes Rod. That would require some introspection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but, but it's also like Sadiq Khan suggesting that uh, he's terribly worried that there aren't enough black cyclists in London, uh, as if as if these the, the black people in London were incapable of going to Halfords. <laughs> I just, it's just, and the, 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 but there are reasons. But people do different things for different reasons, and a lot of them are rooted in culture. I mean, Glastonbury. Um, I wouldn't go there if you paid me an awful lot of money. It seems to be a festival largely for kind of 
white, middle class, middle aged people, the average oh age God. of attending. Rod, uh, I went, so I went there. I, sorry, I went there when it was very much the peak of Jeremy Corbyn's popularity. And oh my God, the red tent. Because of course, Glastonbury was a socialist thing yeah. from the start, wasn't it? Oh, it was yeah, just, yeah. it was intolerable for me. And then it was the day of the Brexit vote too. So while all my friends were crying, I was celebrating in a, yeah. in a tent on my own. So it wasn't the best trip of my life. But the, uh, I mean, the average age of, of, of the uh, Glastonbury attendance uh, is around about 40. Um, uh, you know, the idea that this is a festival for youth is, hasn't been true since the early 70s. But even then, back in the early 70s, Glastonbury, the sort of music which Glastonbury uh, uh, put on, they didn't have soul music, they didn't have reggae music by and large, they didn't have soul music, they didn't have funk. It was largely either uh, British folk rock, uh, heavy rock, heavy metal, or prog rock. And they are all very, very, very white brands of music. Um, pretty awful in some cases, brands of music. All the all the good stuff <clears throat> at that time was being done by by black folk, you know. Uh, so there was no surprise then that Glastonbury didn't have many black people at it. And these days, it's for middle-aged, air-headed, smug, white, middle-aged families. And those are the people it caters to. And, and the, the people they want to listen to are the exact people, because Glastonbury gets its demographic very, very well, are people like Sir Paul McCartney um, and, and Fleetwood Mac and, and bands who really, I don't think we want to hear them very much more of there being so much good music around at the moment. But nonetheless, that is what the Glastonbury demographic is. And the idea that black folk ought to be forced to watch this dross uh, is, is actually, I mean, it's insulting. It's insulting primarily to black people. I mean, that, 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 is, the, that is the worst of it, of course. I just don't but, get you know, it. I just don't get it because we see this in, well, everywhere. The idea that somehow absolutely everything that happens in this country must be, must be done by an equal amount, an equal percentage yeah. of every different group that exists and often more represented of ethnic minorities as well, just to be progressive, I guess. I mean, where does this end? What's the end goal here? The end goal is presumably what, what we see on our televisions when we look at adverts these days, uh, where it seems to be that this country is 75% black, uh, and yet uh, uh, usually in families it's a, it's, a black, it's a black bloke and a white woman, uh, which, which is the view which is put out by the advertisers. I don't know why they do this. It seems to me patronising and insulting to our ethnic minorities. But what, what you say about the countryside is also right. I mean, there have been many, many attempts to get more black folk and Asian folk into the countryside, but it's, it's forgetting elements of culture. You know, the, the black culture in this country, just as it has been in uh, the USA, has been very defiantly urban. You know, not everybody likes walking up a mountain. Not everybody likes going bird watching. You know, there's some people prefer to stay in the cities. It's an absurdity. And I, it's, it's a shame. And of course, it comes from Lenny Henry. And uh, Lenny, who used to be a comedian of, of some sort or another, now seems to be a man who simply can show you racism in a handful of dust, uh, where, what? where whatever he looks at is racist. Well, I know you've been uh, also writing about Gareth Southgate. How has he irked you? By being the manager of England. Um, right, and you said he would be better yeah. suited to, what, being some council leader or diversity champion. What was it? Well, no, I was just trying to think. Of, given that Gareth has, has just overseen England's worst result in 94 years uh, and has kind of thrown away uh, 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 an excellent chance of winning the European Championship, uh, much as a semi-final was thrown away against Croatia by failing to uh, adjust to the game and to react to different changes in the game, uh, I thought that there might be a better job for him somewhere. And I thought that as, as kind of boss of diversity at Worcestershire County Council, I think is probably the kind of size of council that, that Gareth would suit. Uh, and it would take him back to the Midlands where he began his footballing career. Um, the, the, job in the world. Actually making sure that, You've got the so, best sorry, job no, in the no. world. You've got the best job in the world, Rod. You know, your musings, you can just put them to paper and people love them, people find them humorous and they, they enjoy them. It now, just before... Pardon? It never happens, though. I suggest all these excellent ideas 
such as forcing black people to go to Glastonbury and making Gareth the head of diversity at Worcestershire County Council. But no one listens. It never Rod, happens. Rod, someone's going to take that out of context. Someone's going to take that out of context and it'll be viral in no long, in, a, in no time. But you're not on Twitter, so you're safe. But I'm just going to, just before we finish, I just want to ask you a question about the Rwanda illegal immigrant plan. Um, do you think that plane will ever take off? or whatever new plane they use? Or do you think the, the way that our country is run is no longer run by the government? No, I think that's, I, I think what you say, Emily, is absolutely right. And I said, it, as soon as they announced Rwanda, uh, I said the lawyers will stop it. Uh, and I, I, that's exactly what has happened. Uh, we do tend to be run by lawyers these days. And I think uh, uh, Shakespeare's Jack Cade had a point um, um, when, when he said that we need to get rid of them all. I, I, it's, it's very, very difficult. And, and I think the dangerous thing is that the left and those who hate this Rwanda plan uh, aren't looking at outcomes. Um, the, every time they oppose an attempt to sort out the number of people who try to cross the channel in these dinghies and die as a consequence of doing so, every time they object to proposals to, that might stop that, they're enabling more people to die. Uh, they're not looking at the outcome. They're only looking at the chance to do a bit of virtue signaling. Yeah, that's the problem. And when you say, you know, why don't we rethink, you know, the influence that the human, the human rights uh, court in, in Europe might have on us, everyone says, oh, no, it says human rights. That would bring up, put us back to the dark ages. How dare you even consider, consider that or, you know, getting rid of an ethics advisor or whatnot. Um, thank you so much, Rod, for joining me. That was brilliant. Uh, that was associate editor at The Spectator, Rod Liddle. Check out his uh, column in The Spectator about Lenny Henry and his uh, conversation about how there are too many white people at Glastonbury. So, the UK has taken a lot of international criticism for trying to stop dangerous sea crossings by illegal migrants. The so-called Rwanda plan has been attacked by celebrities, bishops, and all the elites, really. But why hasn't the EU faced the same wrath, let alone the same interference from European courts for trying to stop illegal migrants crossing the Mediterranean in very similar ways. Joining me now is social policy analyst and friend of the show and friend of mine also, Dr. Rakib Hassan. Hello, Rakib, how are you? I'm very well, Emily, how are you? I'm very well, I'm having a great time here. Just uh, get to chat to Rod Liddell, now you, it's brilliant. Um, so what do you uh, make of this all? You've written for the mail. So you've said that Europe are being slightly hypocritical here. Well, I think they are, Emily, and I don't think it's just the European Union. I also feel that the United Nations is being deeply hypocritical um, in terms of its uh, comments on the UK-Rwanda migration partnership. The reality of the matter is there have been migrant relocation schemes involving the EU and the United Nations, which have uh, relocated migrants to countries such as Rwanda and also uh, West African countries such as Niger. And I can tell you now, according to the Fragile States Index, uh, Niger as a country is more unstable and more fragile as a nation state when compared uh, to Rwanda. I saw that the German ambassador, when talking about the UK-Rwanda migration partnership, he said that Germany would not, uh, would not uh, do such a thing. But the reality of the matter is Germany does much of that kind of migration relocation work by using its influence and clout within the European Union. It does that through EU funded relocation schemes. So I do feel, Emily, when it comes to much of the commentary uh, surrounding the UK Rwanda Migration Partnership, there's a great deal of hypocrisy. It's, it, it, is this because in this country we have a much noisier minority of lawyers, of elite people, people within the elite? Are they just noisier in Britain than they are elsewhere? Because it does seem like the government can't do anything when it comes to illegal immigration without people being absolutely furious and doing absolutely everything they can to prevent it. Well, I'm, I'm not entirely sure whether we have the degree of social activists in the legal profession, whether that's also the case in other countries. But it's very clear that we do have various actors, um, I, would call, I would consider them to be open borders activists in the legal and charity sectors, who, who ultimately, they, they, they look to obstruct and block any kind of meaningful reform when it comes to our dysfunctional asylum system. And, and I do feel from an ideological perspective 
they're more than happy to do away and dismantle the UK's national borders in the name of uh, maximising global welfare, even if that means sacrificing our own domestic cohesion. And I find that to be an unacceptable position. And Emily, we do need to sort out our dysfunctional asylum system. At the moment, it's very much survival of the fittest. You have largely single, able-bodied young men who can take on those physically challenging journeys, which are facilitated. Ultimately, these men are being illegally imported into the UK by people smuggling enterprises. So what you have, you have really vulnerable groups in other parts of the world, including women and girls who are at serious risk of sexual violence. It's almost like there's a queue jumping process and it's not fair on those relatively vulnerable groups at all. Well, this is what people don't seem to understand, and we seem to be told not to believe what we see with our own eyes. It's very clear to most of us mm. watching what's happening on the channel that it's not women and young children that are crossing over, that are no, making sure. those journeys. It's people that have been able to pay for these people smugglers, the thousands to get across the channel, and we're supposed to believe that absolutely all of them was in a massive threat to their lives. And it's just so frustrating because the average person in this country wants to be welcoming to those who want to do, mm. uh, make their life in this country. But they look at this and they think, you know, they're absolutely taking the mick at the moment. It looks laughable. It makes us look like a silly country that can't even protect its borders and doesn't believe in itself as a nation state. Do you think we've lost pride in this country? Is that what this is about? Well, I think that the UK can take a great deal of pride and should take a great deal of pride in its rich history when it comes to rehoming the world's most persecuted peoples. But there has to be a fair system, one that functions accordingly. I, and another problem I have in terms of asylum policy is that all too often it's the more deprived parts of the country that disproportionately bear the brunt of rehoming newcomers. So uh, that, that system needs to be rectified. There needs to be a fairer distribution process, you could say. And on top of that, as I said before, the asylum system at the moment, I do not feel that it's well ordered. And it certainly doesn't prioritise those who are most at risk of persecution in their homelands. And I think that that's part of the problem. Whenever the government has looked to reform the asylum system, they have faced what I consider to be domestic obstructionists who talk about safe and legal routes, but they don't understand that this process needs to be somewhat streamlined and certain groups have to be prioritised. These are hard-headed decisions, but some people don't want to make the decisions at all. And ultimately, that is the reason why the government's faced so much domestic opposition. That is why they've ended up moving towards striking international agreements such as the UK-Rwanda Migration Partnership. Exactly right. Thanks, Rakib. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, that was social policy analyst Dr. Rakib Asan. Now, a very big change in tone, really. Uh, Love Island is back. You might hate it. I love it. And it's controversial as ever. It scored its largest viewer numbers since 2019. You know, I thought that maybe it had lost its spark, but it clearly hasn't. It's got the biggest figure since 2019, with 5 million tuning into the opening episode. The contestants lounge around a villa, scantily clad, taking part in challenges and coupling up as they battle it out for a split share of a £50,000 prize. But as ever, there is a debate about body image on the show, ethnic diversity and the mental health of those taking part. Here to discuss with me now is entertainment correspondent and writer Rebecca Tomey. Tomey, thank you for joining me. How are you? I'm brilliant, and I'm loving another season of Love Island. It never comes around quick enough for me. <laughs> I was about to say, have you been thoroughly enjoying this season so far? I like Ekin Sue. She's the, uh, she's the woman who knows what she wants, but keeps getting herself uh, stuck in various situations, let's say. Yes, I think, I think you've just hit the nail on the head there. I think uh, representations of, of women is very interesting as the series goes on, because, you know, the show does like to have a sort of very... A wide cast of characters and I think some of the girls get a particularly hard time if they're super confident and know what they want and, and sort of go for it because at the end of the day it is a competition. I think one of the problems as this series have gone on is that it's become a bit of a victim of its own success not just in terms of everyone looking to kind of point the finger at Love Island being responsible for pretty much everything that's wrong in society right now but also that the contestants are very aware of, of themselves now. It's not like the brilliant days of Big Brother where nobody really knew what was going on. And that's what made really incredible reality TV. 
They remember now that they're on camera because they've seen so many people take the abuse when they come off. But sometimes I think they let it slip and they do let their mask down and they yeah. do actually act like how they would. So I'm sure there are some people sitting at home thinking, oh my God, why is Emily talking about Love Island? I mean, seriously, can you try and make it, can you try and explain why actually it's uh, quite an interesting social experiment? It, you know, it is a social experiment. And what I always say is that the heart of it is that it is all about dating and it's a microcosm of modern dating. So anybody, whatever age group you're in, dating is very difficult now because of the way everything's moved online, communications online, apps, the illusion of choice. We have so much choice in all our lives now, particularly with dating. And what something like Love Island very cleverly does is that because everybody's generically gorgeous and attractive, the hierarchy within that group is exactly how it is in society as well. And the interactions between people, the types of choices, the way people treat each other, the way that there are so many options that you don't ever have to really commit to one person. I think also with Love Island is that, yes, it's supposed to be fun. Let's remember that at its core. It is just entertainment. But also it's a bit of an anthropological study. It's looking at mating rituals. It's looking at the Becca, hierarchy. I'm really, I'm really sorry. I'm just going to have to interrupt because we've literally got a matter of seconds. So who's going to win? Oh, you cannot call it within the first week. You cannot. I think call I can that. sue. I think, I think she's going to win. I'm you calling can sue it. For her. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I'm, you. I'm voting, I'm voting for her because I think she's a brilliant, a brilliant example <laughs> and character. Thank you so much for joining me. That was entertainment correspondent and writer Rebecca Toomey. So you've been watching Real Britain with me, Emily Carver. Thank you very much for your company. I've had a great time. Sorry for the minor technological uh, blips. The show is on every Saturday and Sunday at 2 p.m. I'll be back very soon, I'm sure. But for now, I'll leave you with the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking dry and clear for many, but there could be a few showers in southern England. Let's take a look at the details. It will be cloudy to end the day across southwest England. There could be spots of rain as showers push in from the channel. Skies will also be cloudy to end the day in southeast England. There could be spots of light rain here and there, but it should stay dry for most. It should also be a dry end to the day in Wales, with largely clear skies here. It will turn chilly after the sun sets. Highs of 19 degrees. Patchy cloud will push into the Midlands this evening, but it will stay dry across the region. Skies will clear later, and it will be chilly in the countryside. Staying mostly dry across northern England, but a brisk coastal wind will push a few showers towards the northeast. Highs of 19 here as well. It will be clear skies across Scotland this evening, breezy around the coastline, but lighter winds inland. Turning chilly tonight with lows of two degrees. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart, and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me, noon on Saturdays and Sundays. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. 
join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. <laughs> join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.